Good morning. Good morning. There is a crisis looming in America today. Okay, let's face it. There are a number of crises looming in America today. Just think about it. Um, economic disparity among certain sectors of our population. Uh, hunger, childhood obesity, climate change, not enough water in California, too much snow in New England, energy, global competition, the war of terror. Now the list goes on and on. So where do we begin to start to address some of these crises? Well, I believe we begin at the beginning with the American education system. The one place where we might potentially find pathways to address all of these crises facing us today by tapping into our collective creativity. And before my time ends with you today, I'm going to leave you with a, uh, a couple of things, a couple of practices that will empower each and every one of you to be a part of the solution of this crisis, the crisis of creativity. Now, this crisis is real. Corporations know it. They are clamoring for a generation of creative thinkers to help address myriad problems. Ask anyone in corporate America, what are the biggest problems facing your industry today? And certainly within the top three responses, you're going to hear finding a creative workforce to replace the current generation of critical thinkers that are approaching retirement age. And some of these corporations are companies that you would expect. According to the Congressional Steam Caucus, did you know there was a Congressional Steam Caucus? No. There is. And according to the Steam Caucus, many companies have declared this need for the creative workforce. Boeing, Texas Instruments, Adobe, Apple, Intel, companies you would expect. And maybe a few you might not expect. Companies like Nike, Crayola, Reading is Fundamental, and one of my favorites, Sesame Street. Each of these companies recognizes the necessity of the creative process. Each promotes the importance of the arts in our education system as the catalyst for creativity. So when you hear a call to action involving STEM initiatives, I call upon each and every one of you to raise a hand and loudly proclaim, you mean STEAM. Don't ignore the arts. Science, technology, engineering, the arts, and mathematics. In today's world, it requires all of these disciplines to move us forward. And very few of us are experts at more than one, maybe two, of these topics. Hence, the need for collaboration. Now, in order to understand this looming crisis in America, we need to look to the past. When did the arts and sciences, a phrase that was very common for centuries, come to live in separate schools, neighboring houses, distant silos? Well, let's begin back at the beginning. I want to share a few quotes with you. These words could have been spoken today by any number of champions of the STEAM movement. I would teach children music, physics, and philosophy but most importantly music, for the patterns in music and all the arts are the keys to learning. Spoken by Plato. Study the science of art. Study the art of science. Develop your senses. Especially learn how to see. Realize that everything connects to everything else. Leonardo da Vinci. And finally, if I were not a physicist, I would probably be a musician. I often think in music. I live my daydreams in music. I see my life in terms of music. I get most joy in life out of music. Albert Einstein. You see, for centuries, the arts and sciences were interwoven into the fabric of culture, education, and life in America. When great universities were founded, you could be sure to find a college of arts and sciences. Today, there are fewer, having been bifurcated into separate entities. There was one at my alma mater, University of Maryland, when I went there. Today, they have a college of arts and humanities, and a college of behavioral and social sciences, 
here at George Mason University. We have a College of Visual and Performing Arts and a College of Science, even a College of Humanities and Social Sciences. But when I started here 24 years ago, there was a College of Arts and Sciences. Harvard still has one. Princeton does not. <laughs> Yale has a graduate school in arts and sciences, but not undergraduate. It just seems that the artists and the scientists stop engaging with one another at some point. And I think we were pretty used to the idea that art and science went together through the centuries, right up until around the mid-1960s. President Johnson's Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, ESEA. It put the focus on math and reading skills for low-income students, and it tied the test results to federal spending on programs to support K-12 schooling. It has since gone through no fewer than seven iterations over the years. By 1994, it was reauthorized as the Improving America's Schools Act, and both science and technology have been added as important classroom subjects. In 2001, its most recent version emerged, the familiar No Child Left Behind Act. STEM initiatives had moved to the forefront of our education system, but not the arts. Americans for the Arts reported less than a month ago that the U.S. Senate released the latest draft of yet another iteration of ESEA, this one called the Every Child Achieves Act. Now, happily, the Senate draft names the arts as a core academic uh, subject. However, it eliminates the only dedicated arts and education program that has funded more than 200 model grant programs and it also eliminates the 21st century after-school learning programs which support arts education. The original intentions of all this were quite noble, but what were we sacrificing along the way? The practice that I've seen in schools for decades now is to have teachers teach to the test. Read a chapter, study it, test it, and move on. What about retaining the information? What about applying it to practical use. Well, for the most part, teachers' contracts are not assessed on what a child retains, but rather on how high his or her test scores are. High scores equates to federal funding. Where do the arts classes go? Well, many are relegated to after-school programs, Saturday sessions, all for an additional cost and usually taught by private enterprises. Those children who have discovered on their own a passion for an arts discipline, and whose parents can afford it, they get the arts experience growing up. Those who have not been exposed to it, or can't afford it, are once again left behind. So why is it important? Well, because the arts provide an entree into the world of creative thinking. Students given access to the arts as part of their curriculum get better grades. They retain the information much longer. They learn to collaborate, to communicate, to solve problems creatively, to present findings and opinions with confidence and articulation. They develop interpersonal skills. They learn to take risks. Just look at some of the programs out there, like the uh, Wolf Traps Early STEM Arts Program that is prevalent in so many of the Fairfax County, Virginia public schools or the uh, Venezuela El Sistema's inspired programs like Bridges at Cunningham Elementary right down the road in Vienna, Virginia, or right here at Mason, the Potomac Arts Academy, or Acting for Young People with their lessons and classes and camps. Oh my. <laughs> and even the Rhode Island School of Design, RISD, and their STEM to STEAM initiatives. And guess what? Sometimes arts initiatives fail. But so what? Those who think creatively learn to assess, adjust, and reevaluate. Isn't this the kind of employee corporate America is clamoring for? What about that crisis of creativity I mentioned earlier? How did that happen? Well, the members of the workforce that were educated in America prior to the 1970s, that creative class, is retiring. And they're doing so at a time in our history when global solutions to complex issues have never been more urgent. I truly believe that creative thinkers will jumpstart all sectors of American life. 
business, the arts, government, technology, invention, health, scientific discovery, which will take us into the 21st century with a healthier economy, a clearer pathway to progress, and a stronger position in a competitive global market. And believe me, those competitors, the European and Asian markets, they make the arts a high priority in the education of their citizens. The STEAM subjects, all of them, are of equal importance. I'm not here to say that the arts are going to save science and technology, any more than science and tech are going to rescue the arts. But by getting into the habit of interdisciplinary collaboration, we all benefit. I like the RISD mantra, that the disciplines are stronger together than apart. And just because it's more effective for K through 12 doesn't mean it's too late for the high schools, the colleges, even the current workforce to get on board. A more interdisciplinary approach to higher education is on its way. And uh, you can create a culture of creativity within the walls of existing corporations. In other words, we can grant permission to those who wish to aspire higher. You know, here's the irony in all of this. You look around the world today, the uh, coexistence, the symbiosis of art and science is everywhere. It's everywhere. We just need to sit up and take notice of it. I'll give you an example. Can you imagine MP3 recording technology without the sleek design of the iPod that brought it into mass consumption? Or the combustible engine, a better example, hybrid technology, without the artistry of a well-crafted advertising campaign? The television and film industries are the backbone of the entertainment industry today. And they use technology to bring the work of directors, writers, actors, singers, dancers, to millions of people who in turn use technology to access their favorite programs whenever and wherever they wish. How would the performing arts be appreciated in front of a live audience without the science and technology of acoustics, or the finesse of a brilliant lighting design, or the convenience of a computer program that allows us to purchase our tickets online. Those who choose to remain in their own silos do so at their own peril. It is through interaction that the magic happens. Now, I've shared with you today some of my own observations about STEAM. And I'll be the first to admit I don't have all the answers. But I can suggest three ways in which we can all be part of the solution. Communicate, collaborate, and advocate. Talk about STEAM to whoever will listen. You will likely find, as I did, many people who agree with you, at least on some level. We all know that arts and education helps children who are introverted, or who have been victims of bullying, or feel like they just don't fit in. The arts truly leave no child behind. Consider providing a platform for these like-minded individuals. I started with a simple email listserv, trading business cards with uh, anyone willing to keep the conversation going. And when someone mentioned a related event, an email blast helped support that initiative. Use social media. Facebook and Twitter are so commonplace these days anyone can master them. Exponentially increase the number of people involved in the conversation. And if you can't figure it out, ask a kid. <laughs> Engage the younger generation as a key component, as a partner to your message. Not only will they spread the word faster and better than any adult ever will, myself included, but many of them have an unbridled enthusiasm and a passion for the STEAM movement. They get it. Now, like any startup business, you need, a, you need to be taken seriously with a nice, simple website, Nicely designed business card, photos, etc. None of this is expensive or even difficult. Seek financial or in-kind support when you're ready. One of the allures of an, of an initiative like this is that um, we don't often ask each other for money or even for much of each other's time. It's largely non-competitive. It's largely moral support. Oh, you're doing that? Well, I guess I have permission now to do something similar in or in my region. 
Financial support, of course, does become necessary for any worthwhile endeavor. There are government and corporate grants out there, and uh, they are especially available when tied to an educational purpose. And in my experience, the most successful grants recognize strong collaboration. Consider hosting an event. Bring everyone under one tent. It can be a meeting, a conversation, a show, a demonstration, a forum for discovery and discussion, and attend as many such events as you have time for. Network. Communicate. It's the first step towards collaboration. Now, these are simple baby steps, but multiply them by hundreds or even thousands of practitioners. It begins to make a difference. I did these very things over the last couple of years. In our school of theater, we now host a steam table at Mason with over 120 members representing 40 organizations. Our social media accounts are alive and active and fed by a group of Mason students I refer to as my steam team. Aren't they a good looking bunch? In October of 2015, we will present a day-long discovery forum at the Hilton Performing Arts Center in Manassas on the Prince William campus of George Mason University, recently renamed the Mason Science and Technology Campus. And that will be followed at the end of that same day by the world premiere of a theatrical concert called To Swing Through the Sky, which celebrates the twin evolutions of aeronautics and jazz music in America. Flight and jazz, science and art, arts and sciences. And by following my own mantra of communicate, collaborate, I find that I have now become an advocate. And it's why I was invited to come speak with you today. So there's one last thing I want to ask you to do. As you're having conversations about this, whenever, wherever you hear the term STEM, Holla back steam. <laughs> stem, steam. Stem, steam. Stem, steam. You get it. Thank you very much.